All right. So it's my pleasure to um, welcome Sarah Reitzis, who's going to tell us about comparing induction and bounding principles over RCA naught and RCA naught star. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, so to start, we need some background on pi one two problems, which we often look at in reverse math. Um, so a pi one two problem is a sentence for all x theta of x implies there exists a y psi of x y of second order arithmetic where theta and psi are arithmetic, and we say that a subset x of omega such that theta of x holds is an instance of a pi one two problem. And a solution is a subset y of omega such that psi of x, y holds. And we typically denote pi one, two problems by p and q. And so in reverse math, we work in second order arithmetic. Our usual base theory is RCA naught, which corresponds roughly to computable mathematics. The formal definition of RCA naught is that it's the first order axioms for a discrete ordered commutative semi ring, which basically means we have multiple with zero one and they all work as they should, um, together with delta, so set comprehension for delta zero one sets and sigma zero one induction, meaning induction for sigma zero one formulas. Um, but if that's confusing for the purposes of this talk, it's really fine to just think of RCA naught as computable mathematics. We'll also have occasion to consider RCA naught star, which is RCA naught where sigma zero one induction is weakened to sigma zero zero induction. So you can kind of think of it as a system that's like slightly weaker than RCA not so slightly weaker than core, than computable mathematics. Um, we have a couple different types of reducibilities that will will be useful for this talk. So we say that um, a principle P is computably reducible to Q and write it as shown. If whenever X is an instance of P from X, we can compute an instance X hat of Q such that whenever y hat is a solution to x hat from x together with y hat a solution to x. Um, we also will consider Virock reducibility, which has this complicated looking definition with Turing functionals, but really it's just the uniform version of computable reducibility. So now we have a uniform way of computing an instance of Q from an instance of P in a uniform way of computing a solution to our instance of P. Um, there's also a reducibility, which we won't go into too much detail about in this talk, called omega reducibility, which um, is basically reducibility um, in terms of omega models, which are models where the first order part is a standard natural numbers. And so we would have, we can also say P is omega reducible to Q if whenever RCA naught plus Q is an omega model, or whenever we have an omega model of RCA naught plus Q, it's also an omega model of P. And the advantage of omega reducibility is that it allows us to use multiple instances of Q to solve an instance of P, um, computable and Virock reducibility only allow us to use one instance of Q to solve an instance of P. But even though omega reducibility allows us multiple uses of Q, it's not in a uniform way. So the question came up of what if we would like to use multiple instances of Q in a uniform way. Um, and uh, along, this, along these lines, Hirschfeld and Jockish introduced the idea of a reduction game, in particular, uh, two-player reduction games for principles P and Q, which we write as G of Q implies P. And the way this game works, typically, is we have two players, and player one starts off by playing some instance of Q and player two's goal is to solve this instance of Q. So they can either solve it right away 
in which case we didn't really need the game, or they're allowed to play an instance of P computable from the instance of Q. And so when they play an instance of P, player two, I mean, player one has to solve that instance of P because one of the rules of the game is if player one, if either player can't make a move, then the other player wins. So basically we have player two playing an instance of P, player one solving it, player two playing an instance of P, player one solving it, and on and on until finally player two is able to solve the original instance of Q, in which case player two wins, or if the game never ends, then player one wins. So this is kind of a way of representing reducibility with multiple instances of Q in a uniform way, as we were hoping. And this le leads to the definition that we say P is generalized by rock reducible to Q, which we'll sometimes call GW reducibility, if player two has a computable winning strategy for their game of Q implies P. We can also extend the notion of a pi one two problem and the reduction game of Q implies P to a more general setting. Um, in what is written, I'll have it extended over RCA not just because I thought it was good to have one example to keep in mind, but everything that can be done over RCA not can also be done over RCA not star, which will be useful later in this talk. So yes, we can extend to the game over RCA not, which we write as a, with a superscript of RCA not, and we can then make some analogous definitions. We can say that P is generalized by rock reducible to Q over RCA not, and write it as shown with the superscript of RCA not. If player two has a computable, meaning in this case delta zero one, Winning strategy for the reduction game over RCA naught of Q implies P. We can also make similar definitions of computable reducibility over RCA naught and fire rock reducibility over RCA naught. And um, so the original reduction game we kind of saw captured the idea of omega reducibility in a game. And then if you have a computable winning strategy, that makes it more uniform. Um, and here we have a similar kind of uh, like analogy um, where this game captures provability over RCA naught. Or if we are playing over RCA naught star, it would capture provability over RCA naught star. It captures provability over whatever system we're playing over. We have a nice compacting compactness result about these extended games um, that was proved um, by Demir Jafora, Dennis Hirschfeld, and I, where if we have a set of principles gamma that the like official condition is that it needs to be a consistent extension of delta zero one comprehension by pi one one formulas that proves the existence of a universal sigma zero one formula. That's kind of a complicated condition, but for our purposes, it's enough to know that RCA naught and RCA naught star both satisfy this condition. So therefore this theorem applies to gamma equals RCA naught and gamma equals RCA naught star. And so what this result says is that if we have pi one two problems P and Q and whatever we choose for gamma proves that Q implies P, then there's an N such that Player two has a winning strategy for the game over gamma of Q implies P that ensures victory in at most N many moves. And otherwise, player one has a winning strategy for the game over gamma plus Q. Um, so this is pretty cool because it means that no matter what the original instance of Q that player one plays, player two can always win in N moves. Um, there's always an end move strategy. So this will have a lot of applications. Um, you might notice that in the theorem statement, we have these little hats over uh, G and that's, we have to make a slight modification of the game, but the general idea that I've discussed still holds. 
so let's look at some examples of how how all this kind of like helps us see the differences between principles. So in reverse math, we often consider the sigma zero two bounding principle v sigma zero two, which over RCA naught we can state as the pi one two problem bound star. Bound star is the principle that for a simultaneous enumeration of bounded sets F0 through Fn, there exists a common bound for the sets Fi. We can also think of a strong version of bound star, which is a version of bound star where the number of sets is not part of the instance. So it's the same idea. We have a simultaneous enumeration of bounded sets, and we are looking for a common bound on the sets. We just don't know how many sets. We'll also consider a principle that we call F sigma zero one, which is the principle that for every sigma zero one set A with a non-empty complement, there exists an A in the complement of A such that either A is zero or A is a successor of some element of A. So this is a really natural way to think of sigma zero one induction as a pi one two principle because it's saying Given a sigma zero one set, well, if induction fails, it either fails at zero or there's some number where uh, that it's not in the set, but its predecessor in the set and induction fails that way. Um, we can also think of principles of the form like F sigma zero N for any N. We just have to be a bit more careful in how we and a zero n set. And likewise, we can think of f pi zero one, which is the exact same thing as f sigma zero one, but instead we're talking about pi zero one sets. Um, and what's interesting, which we'll see later about f sigma zero one and f pi zero one, is that pi zero one and sigma zero one action are the same. Um, the proof is not obvious. It requires a trick. They're the same. But in our setting, they, um, the principles F sigma zero one and F pi zero one will prove not to be the same. So the complexity of the proof that the induction is the same kind of is captured by, in our setting, by this difference. And as with F pi zero one, we can also think, I mean, as with F sigma zero one, we can think about F pi zero n the way we think about F sigma zero n as well for any n. We can also consider the principle CN, which just says um, an instance is an enumeration of the complement of a non-empty set X and the solution is an element of X. So this is kind of a principle that seems fairly obvious. It's given the enumeration of a set um, with non-empty complement, like give me an element of the complement. And it turns out that in terms of by rock reducibility over our CA naught, it's pretty easy to say, see that F sigma zero one and CN are the same. And they're also the same as a principle that we call C delta zero two, which is like CN extended to delta zero two set. Um, I've also shown that F sigma zero one generalized by rock reduces over RCA naught star to bound star. Um, and note that this is a stronger result than if we had a reduction over RCA naught because RCA naught, RCA naught star is weaker than RCA naught, so it has more models. So saying we have a reduction over RCA naught star is stronger than saying we just have a reduction over RCA naught. Um, and, but um, having a generalized Virock reduction is kind of weaker than having a Virock reduction um, because it means we need to use multiple instances of the, the principle on the right-hand side. Um, so I was looking to see if we could get it down to a Virock reduction over RCA naught star from F sigma zero one to bound star but I could only get a reduction from F sigma zero one to strong bound star, which is weaker. Um, 
And what's interesting here is that CN is strictly weaker in terms of Viroc reducibility over RCA not star than bound star. And in fact, it turns out that S sigma zero one is not generalized Viroc reducible over RCA not star to CN, despite the fact that in terms of reducibility over RCA not, they're equivalent. And in fact, F sigma zero one is not Viroc reducible over RCA not star to bound star. Um, for completeness, I also found that bound star is not Viroc reducible over RCA not to F sigma zero one. So therefore it's also not reducible over RCA not star. Um, and likewise, strong bound star is not Viroc reducible over RCA not or RCA not star to F sigma zero one. Was there, can I interrupt for a second? Can you remind yeah. me again the strong bound star? Sorry, I had trouble, I had trouble figuring out exactly what, what, what is the strong bound? I mean, like, I mean, it's got to be some bound, otherwise you've got an infinite collection of bounds. Yeah, so, so yeah, so bound star versus strong bound star. Strong bound star is just kind of, um, it's it's kind of like the idea of like Ramsey's theorem uh, for singletons uh, versus like strong Ramsey's theorem for singletons. It's like the number of sets isn't part of the instance for strong bound star, just like with Ramsey's theorem, the number of colors wouldn't be part of the instance for the strong version. So we know oh. that there's some finite number of sets. We just don't know what that finite number is. Um, we also, I also found that F I01 is Viroc reducible over RCA not star to S sigma zero one. But as I was alluding to on the previous slide, this will not reverse, which we'll see in a minute. And F delta zero two is generalized Viroc reducible over RCA not star to bound star, where F delta zero two is the same idea as F sigma zero one, but extended to delta zero two sets. Where again, we have to be careful about what is a delta zero two set in RCA not or RCA not star. Um, and so these reductions all came about more or less by just like thinking about the differences between the principles, like fiddling with them and figuring it out. Um, so there's not like a clear method for how to get these reductions. But the non-reductions, there are two methods that I used mainly that I wanted to talk about. Um, so the first one is notice that every F sigma zero one instance has solutions in RCA naught, but there exists F sigma zero one instances without solutions in RCA naught star because sigma zero one induction always holds in RCA naught, but not necessarily in RCA naught star. And so likewise, the same thing holds for F pi zero one. Um, CN, however, is just saying, given the enumeration of a set with non-empty complement, there's an element of the complement. So that's always going to be true in both RCA naught and RCA naught star. Bound star and strong bound star are both versions of sigma zero two bounding which doesn't necessarily hold in RCA not star or RCA not. So they're both going to have instances without solutions in RCA not and RCA not star. And so just these facts and basically like dividing these principles into two columns gives us a bunch of non-reductions, including bound star is not generalized by rock reducible over RCA not to F sigma zero one, uh, we don't have a reduction from bound star to CN. We don't have a reduction from F sigma zero one to CN. And we don't have a reduction from F pi zero one to CN. So some of these I showed on the past slide, um, but this is kind of the why behind them. And this method is interesting. It gives us some interesting non-reductions, but we're not doing anything fancy here. This is really just saying that in fact, we don't have omega reducibility um and we're just making use of like what the what models of these principles look like
The other main method I used to find non-reductions was this meta theorem, which came about because I was noticing that when I was like kind of brute forcing non-reductions, several of them looked very similar in structure. And so this led to this meta theorem, which says that if we have pi one, two principles, P and Q, and P and Q are first order, which is just saying that the codomain is the natural numbers, um, and Q has computable instances, which we just need for the proof to go smoothly, then we require that P, for P there exists a computable procedure for computing a number K from X for any P instance X, such that X has a solution between zero and K. So this says that every P instance has this associated number K, such that K can be computed from the instance and K bounds at least one solution of the instance. And then for Q, we require that every initial segment sigma of a Q instance and any finite K and any k plus one numbers, then we can extend this initial segment to a q instance that avoids all these k plus one numbers as solutions. Um, I am not going to go through the proof um, because I want to have time to talk about some of the applications of this, but I think some of the conditions kind of allude to how the proof works. So on the one hand, we can bound a solution of P. And on the other hand, we have the, we can avoid a certain number of solutions for our Q instance. And so I should give the conclusion of the meta theorem. Um, the conclusion is that Q does not generalize Virac reduce in N steps to P for any fixed N. And so if we can't get a GW reduction in N steps, and in particular, we can't get a GW reduction in one step, which is a Virac reduction. And because of the compactness result, um, since um, for our reduction over RCA naught and RCA naught star, we're always give we're always um, guaranteed like a bound on the number of steps it takes. That means we also don't have a Viro a generalized Virac reduction over RCA naught from Q to P. And we also don't have a generalized Virac reduction over RCA naught star from Q to P. Um, so this is kind of a complicated theorem, but um, and I'm gonna skip the proof sketch in the instance of time, but I wanted to talk about the applications, which are that if we have, we have this set X of principles, a lot of them I haven't talked about. The ones in red I have talked about. Um, and we have this set Y of principles. Again, most of them, except for F pi zero one, um, like I don't expect that you know what they are. Um, and because of the meta theorem, it turns out that for any Q and X and any P and Y, there's no GW reduction in N steps from Q to P for any fixed N. Hence, no GW reductions over RCA naught or RCA naught star. Um, and basically, X is the set of principles that satisfy that last condition um, on Q. And Y is the set of principles that satisfy the condition number four on P. So they have that associated parameter K. And so in particular, this means, this gives us the reduction that I've mentioned that F sigma zero one does not reduce to F pi zero one. This also gives us CN does not reduce to F pi zero one. F sigma zero one does not reduce to KN, which is just CN restricted to compact sets. Um, and F delta zero two does not reduce to F pi zero one. Um, and so these are all, I, I've written them all as generalized Virac reductions in N steps for any N, but of course 
as I've said, that means that we don't have the reduction over our CA naught or over our CA naught star. And therefore, in particular, we don't have a FIROC reduction over either of those systems. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I think I'm about out of time, but I'm, yeah, that's what I have. Thanks. Um, are there any questions for Sarah? Um, I actually have kind of a, a basic question. Could you um, say a few more words about what it means to say be Vyrock reducible over our say not? Yeah, yeah. I kind of glossed over that, but it means, um, so if we go back to the idea of the game, um, oh, went back a little too far. Um, yeah, so we extend this game. Or generalized um, Vyrock would be fine as well, yeah. Yeah, generalized Vyrock over RCA naught just means that we, when we extend the idea of the game to a game over RCA naught, generalized Vyrock reducible over RCA naught means we have a computable winning strategy for this extended game. Um, Vyrock reducibility. Means Sorry, but what, that, what does it mean to extend over our say not? What does it mean? Extend it over our say not? Yeah. That so that means that when we're playing the game, we're essentially working in a model of our CA not. Like we're playing the game in a model of our CA not. And now so instead you're playing of non standard like, instances, you can be playing non standard instances. Yes. Uh, something like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, that, that, that was what I, what I was missing, but thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, well, if not, let's thank Sarah again. <laughs>